moins de 15 taxistes sur les rues de Dakar. Her documentaries explore class, feminism, and post-colonial power structures. Her sculptures examine the historical weight of the raw materials themselves. Teresa Traoré Dahlberg is both a visual artist and a filmmaker. She grew up between two homelands, Sweden and Burkina Faso. Her first solo exhibition in Paris, Idrik's Three, is showing through March 16th at the Andrein Shevchenko Gallery. Teresa Traoré Dahlberg, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. And congratulations on your show. What does it mean to you to be having your first solo exhibition here in Paris? It's great. It's great because it's definitely a place, a melting pot. So uh, yesterday we had the opening and I could, there was people from all over the world coming and also friends and family from Burkina Faso, from Sweden, from, so it's really, uh, it's, yeah, it's a big thing. Yeah, that's so <laughs> <Yeah>. nice. <laughs> Let's talk about your bronze sculptures, notably Idrik's. I know it was inspired by a bird in an African folktale, and it was also made in collaboration with a foundry in Burkina Faso. Yes, it's uh, both Hakili, as you could see as well, and the, the hair, and Idrik's are inspired by uh, my grandmother's tales. And um, it's for me, the material itself is very important, and the bronze... It, it's melted different bronze materials from Burkina Faso and and um it's yeah it's a it's a the place itself it's it's very important but yeah, it's a, you mentioned yeah. the hair those I like those sculptures yes. a lot too they were kind of positioned as if they were gossiping or something in the exhibition altogether what what do the bird and the hair kind of represent in your grandmother's stories yeah it started with I was invited to the the archive in the ethnographic museum in Stockholm and uh, when going there, I, I found a small, small little hair, 2.2 centimeters about, that was made in bronze. And um, it came from Burkina Faso, and it came from Bobo de Ulasso, where my grandmother is from. Uh, and she had just recently um, uh, passed away. And so I was really trying to remember her. And when thinking of her, I was she, she was very known to me as a and to our family as a, a storyteller. She was telling stories, and she gathered the family to tell stories. So I started gathering her stories, uh, but also working with the shape of the hair. And when working with it, I went to uh, Burkina Faso, because I go back and forth, and my family is there as well. And uh, when showing this bronze sculpture to, to the bronze workers, everyone gathered and looked at it and was really uh, amazed about the shape that they haven't seen in the Burkina context for a very long time. Let's take a listen uh, to what the gallery's director, Céline Andrein, had to say about your work. She was interviewed by Valentin Erba. The universe of her work is really about transformation. Transformation of different materials, transformations of different artifacts, transformation of ideas. It's a very poetic universe. Different kinds of um, technical ways of productions in, in, in this exhibition. What she's been doing here that you can see right behind me is a bronze foundry that has been done in Burkina Faso, which is bronze but also other kinds of materials that have other uh, origins, could be weapons, could be things like that. So, Teresa, you were telling us about your hair sculpture, but you didn't get to tell us about Idrik's, who yes. was the bird. Tell us about that one. Yeah, it, it was also inspired by a story that my grandmother told. And I remember a melody and uh, that I could sing the melody, but I didn't know what was said. So I asked uh, my father about it, and he told me that it, it was about, to, to make a long story short, it was a girl that was became friends with a... Uh, with a bird, a year of drought. Uh, and when she sang a specific song, out came, the bird did like this and out came seeds. So she took it back to the society. And she did, kept doing that for a couple of days and everyone was happy. And then after a while they started wondering, what's the secret? How do we get to, how do we get, uh, how, how does she do it? So they, but she couldn't say because it was a secret. So she, they went after her into the woods and, um, and they, they saw, they got the recipe, they saw her singing the song, 
uh, and out came food. So they took the bird and they sang the song over and over again. And the bird became weaker and weaker. And once everyone had food, they wanted more. It's the human greed. So they wanted meat. So they started, they went out to chase and the, the bird that flew slower than the others got shot. And that was the bird that gave them food. And to me, this mm -hmm. is connected to long-term thinking, to also how we use the resources, uh, the short-term thinking, but also about the industries. I work a lot with industry materials, about industries that are constantly moving globally um, and always have to become bigger and bigger, accelerate in a specific way. Uh, so for me, this is all connected about thinking about the state of the world. Yeah, absolutely. And, it, and it's something we see a lot in your visual, uh, your work as a visual artist. You also make documentaries, though. Your first feature length film, Waga Girls, is about a group of teenage girls becoming car mechanics um, in Burkina Faso. It came out in 2017. Let's take a look. <laughs> On a plus mangue à l'école ici qu'à la maison de Teresa, your first film was also about women in sort of the world of cars. Taxi Sister followed one of the only 15 female taxi drivers in Dakar. Uh, what drew you to each of those stories for your documentaries? Well, there were several years between them. Uh, and when doing Taxi Sister, I really needed uh, a woman in a West African country that was a protagonist that I could look up to, a hero. And she was really someone that I followed her in her everyday life. And she had taken a choice to go against the norm, to do something that wasn't expected of her as a woman. And she wasn't always, she received applause, applause on the street, but she also received a lot of knocks along the way. So it took a very much a, a, a steady decision every day to keep doing what she was doing. And she was the one supporting her family with her work. But with, when doing Waga Girls, it was actually the opposite that attracted me, because it's girls that ended up between shares in society, but that um, are in a car mechanic school uh, and are teenage. They're still young, and they don't know what they want. They didn't necessarily choose to be pioneers uh, within this job that a lot of people had a lot of opinions about. So they were really in a shift in life at the same time as Burkina Faso was also in a shift politically. Uh, it was a year of transition after uh, the president had been for 27 years. So it was a lot of uh, a state of in, in the air in, in Ouagadougou, but also in the girls' lives. So Yeah, and is that what you wanted to show? Or what did you want people to kind of come away from that, that documentary understanding about those young girls? Yeah, for me, it's very, it, I, I like everyday stories and I like to come close in the details of the everyday. And when going to film school for a lot of years, I, there were very few films that I got to see where, where it was not about like poverty or um, extreme war, or extreme disease, extreme situations. Uh, and I lacked the, the everyday story. And there's been a lot of films made though. I mean, Burkina Faso is one of the film countries in the world with Fespaco every other year. Film for me has always been very close, uh, but I really love to follow uh, characters in their everyday life. And I know you're also inspired by science fiction, which is sort of far from everyday <laughs> life. You like to imagine alternative futures and new socio-political structures. This is sort of a difficult question, but what might your ideal world look like? What would some of the elements in it be? Uh, that's a huge question. How would the uh, uh, utopian world be? And I think I'm finding it out, and I want everyone to keep also trying to focus on what, what are the possibilities and how can we actually change things for the better. 
in different ways. <laughs> and Teresa, we ask all of our guests to choose another work of art that's inspired them lately. And you chose the film, If Only I Could Hibernate. It's about a family living in Mongolia. Tell us about it and what drew you to it. Now, this is a film that's out in cinemas right now and that I haven't seen yet. Mm. So it's a film that I want to see. Uh, and it's a, it's a Mongolian, um, a Mongolian director. It's her first long film. And it's about everyday life in Mongolia, about the, uh, the, these kids that are, are left from the parents, and the, but at the same time having... Uh, He's, he's going through a physics test and yeah, I read a little bit and I heard a lot about it and it's something that I really want to see and I also, uh, it's Alexandra Strauss who's editing it, who is um, the person that I've been working with, with Waga Girls and who I usually work close with in different collaborations and she has also edited um, I'm Not Your Negro with Raoul Peck and Exterminate the Brutes. So I know that when she's involved with the project it's usually interesting. So this is a film I'm looking forward to see. It sounds like a personal project also about everyday life, so everyday echoes life, of your yes. work as well. But another uh, place of the world that I've never been, Yeah, so it's interesting. Well, we'll end with a look then at If Only I Could Hibernate. Teresa Traore Dahlberg, uh, Dahlberg, thank you again so much. A reminder uh, that her show Idrik's Three is running through mid-March at the Andrein Shevchenko Gallery here in Paris. Thanks so much for watching. The news is coming up after this. <laughs> Чадо. А